It is time for Pet Files, Ask the Vet, underwritten by the Millerton Veterinary Practice, traditional small animal medicine and surgery, chiropractic, laser therapy, acupuncture, and Chinese herbal medicine, 518-789-3440, millertonvet.com. With us today, Dr. Carolyn Cannon, owner and chief vet at the Millerton Veterinary Practice. Good morning. Hello, Dr. Cannon. What do you have to ask the vet this morning? Uh, I have a, an official question from Alan in New Milford and an unofficial question from Jill in Sharon. Which would you like first? You choose. <laughs> Jill from Sharon. Can dogs eat edamame? Yes, they can. I mean, I don't see why not. I think everything, because it's a soy product. Um, That's what I was asking. Yeah, yeah I, don't think it's, I don't think it would bother them. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I don't think that... Did your dogs get into your edamame? Jill and Sharon? No comment. Okay. No comment. All <laughs> right, so Alan in New Milford, and it was the blind one, too, uh, the, 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 and uh, the, the, the blind... It, it, you know, she's just relentless. She, she loves uh, veggies? Uh, I, I think she just likes discovery. She likes flushing food. You know, she's a flushing... The nice, the nice thing about them getting into vegetables, they usually don't eat the container. It's the uh, right. dogs who eat the container from because it's coated with chicken grease. I know. That's it becomes a problem. All right. Now, Alan in New Milford, can dogs get giardia from swimming in a creek and then licking themselves? Uh, theoretically, yes. Yeah, that makes so sense. So the giardia cysts are in the water, or maybe in the water. I mean, it's not, I don't believe that it's a, a common situation, but um, potentially could be in the water. And so at any time that they're going to get water in the mouth, um, in the gut, is where you would get infected with giardia. All right, and do you have any, I just have curiosity, how long does it take? I believe it's a couple of weeks um, for the, the oocysts to, um, they have to invade the lining of the intestine and before they cause some problems. The, the reason I'm asking is, does it, does it take any, uh, any less time for, uh, um, does it take any less time for if, if, if you're just swimming? Or is it pretty much two weeks? Um, you know what? I I don't know exactly, but I would guess. But by having a um, knowledge of the way parasites work, I think it's going to take them a little while to actually cause a problem because they have to cause cysts in the in the intestine, and so they usually need to go through a phase in order to do that. And then you you have to wait a while to get that inflammation, and then you get the diarrhea gotcha. and sometimes vomiting. All right. So you, so it, in other words, you can't. It, here's it's here's, not going to be the next day. That's what I'm going for because so many things. There's so many people sort of uh, not sort of actually analyze things. Well, this is what happened yesterday. Like, no, 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 no. I don't want to know what happened yesterday. I want to know what happened a week ago. And that that's really what I was uh, right. going for. So it wouldn't be a day or two. No. Okay. Uh, Nicolette in Saugerties. I'm not much of a pet person. Our ten year old son keeps goldfish. He started out with four of them. They were doing okay, and then all at once, one by one, they started getting sick and dying. We don't know why. But what happened yesterday is my neighbor's cat, Muffins, got in and caught the last one. In fact, I walked in on Muffins eating it. It wasn't a happy moment. Anyway, we don't know why the goldfish were ailing, so we don't know if my neighbor's cat is in trouble health-wise. What do you think? Well... I think that goldfish questions aren't fair <laughs> to ask a veterinarian. <laughs> I'm not sure that I know very much about goldfish more than you do. And uh, my, But my educated guess would be that if the kitty is fine now, it probably won't be a problem. Um, you I'm know, sorry. if your neighbor's cat, Muffins, is still alive, then probably not a problem. I, I, um, you know, all I know about with, with goldfish is, is ick, ichthyosis, which... Um, I think is a fungus. The interesting thing is, is that there probably are very few um, cross species problems. Even even a fungus, I wouldn't think would be uh, that went down a, a cat's gullet would be a problem more than vomiting. But I don't know that for sure. Not a fair question. All right. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna back out of that. All right, good, good good job on backing out of it, and I'm certainly no much more not much more use because I I was once I didn't realize that uh, my sister's 
goldfish were being kept in distilled water, so I changed the water and... Oh, no. Yeah, that was bad. Um, so, as I said... It Maybe was, that's what happened here. I was just... I, I, right. That, you know, I didn't think of that. That's probably, though, what happened. Yeah, and goldfish are pretty hardy, is my understanding. They are. They are. I mean, you know... You, yeah. And, uh, until somebody comes along and does something um, really helpful. To unbalance. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Tasha in New York City, there is a ton of construction dust in my neighborhood, and since it's hot, the fan's always sucking dust into the apartment. It's been really hard on my two indoor cats. Their eyes look goopy and irritated. I got to the vet and got get I, I got to the vet and get medicine, it clears up, and then it starts up again in a couple of weeks. Can you give a cat regular eye drops like Visine? Um, not Visine, but you can use So for cats and dogs who get lots of debris in their eyes, and especially the cats and dogs who have protruding eyeballs um, tend to pick up more, um, then you can rinse them with an an eye flush. So a a human um, eye wash would be okay to use, and rinsing them out, especially maybe toward the end of the day, um, with several drops of eye wash, um, is not a bad idea. The eye drops, you know, you don't need an antibiotic if you're ca- if you're just getting dust from irritation. You need um, to get rid of the dust, or, or you know, some animals will also need a little bit of a corticosteroid. But you have to be super careful with that because if you have an ulcer or scratch on the eyeball, that can make it worse. Uh, so my recommendation always is how can we solve the problem at the beginning rather than treat the problem at the end? And um, I wonder if there's a fan with a filter or some other way to stop all that dust from coming in. Yeah, that becomes hard. Can you get little kitty goggles? <laughs> That's an idea, too. No, I, I, Maybe an air conditioner. Would that stop the dust from coming in? Um, or uh, I know that's not easy in an apartment. Um, but, uh, and it also depends on how old it is and how sealed and how not sealed. Mm, um, okay. um, th- why, just, why not Visine? There used to be, and this is, there used to be something called Dacrius, which was great. And it was an eye wash for humans and I used it on dogs. It was, it was fantastic. And then it just disappeared. And I've n- had trouble except in the, um, oh, I should know this. There, there, there is a line of um, of eye products, you know, f- for contacts, etc. Mm-hmm. And they have something yeah, similar, but it was never as it, it. It, it's just more designed for humans. The Dacrios um, bottle, such as it was, uh, was a squirt bottle, plastic, but it worked for any. It, it worked for dog eyes as well as for human eyes. I'm one. Well, the Visine has some has a drug in it that constricts blood vessels. Oh, that's not good. So we don't want that to happen. But um, the best product that I've used is the Veteracin eye wash. And it used to come, so Veteracin ha- is, has antimicrobial activity without having an antibiotic in it. And it uh, uh, is soothing and um, so works quite well for this kind of thing. But And they have it for cats, because I'm just looking. Uh, they have, well, the, it came up until about two weeks ago. It came in small bottles that you could hold in your hand, which I loved. You could put it in like an eye drop. But now it comes in bigger bottles, just like the rest of the eye wash um, hmm. clan. And um, I find that it's hard to manipulate into putting into a small animal's eye. But you could always put some in a dropper, in a, in a new dropper bottle, and use a dropper from it, or just figure out how to how to manipulate that bigger bottle. All right. Well, first, it, it, as soon as you can, you'll be able to give instructions to the rest of us. Um, well, I can do it. I can do it. It's just that you you waste a lot. Right. No, I. <laughs> I hate to say that I'm one of those humans that wastes a lot no matter what, holding my head back trying to figure out how to get whatever it is. But it's just, <laughs> yeah. All right, Corbin and Jesse in Colren, Massachusetts. We have a dog, two cats, and a hamster. So, of course, people are always asking us if we will foster an animal until they find a home. Usually we say, okay, if the animal is healthy. We're on the fence about this kitten that has a bad case of mange. He's in good shape otherwise, so we'd like to help out, but how can we take the little guy in without our whole menagerie catching it? And what about the kids? We've got a four-year-old and a newborn. I think um, I probably wouldn't advise 
Well, number one, there are three kinds of mange that cats can get, so we don't know what kind it is. If it's demodectic mange, which is all of the mange in cats, is pretty rare, pretty unusual. Um, demodectic mange is is uh, something that's not contagious. So uh, it sounds to me as though someone's made it clear that it is. The other thing is that we want to make sure that this is a clear diagnosis of mange, that it didn't just come from the rescue, that they've taken this cat to the vet and had a, a clear diagnosis because the most common thing for a kitten to have is um, ringworm. And you don't want to bring a cat with ringworm into your house with little kids because everybody could end up with it um, and your, and your, your pets as well. Um, so let, let's make sure we have a clear diagnosis and what kind of, of mange it is. So demodectic mange is not contagious. Ringworm is contagious caused by a fungus. Uh, sarcoptic mange, sarcoptic, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the mite in cats, but anyway, it's sarcoptes, same, same type of mange that dogs can get. And um, that uh, is very highly contagious. And so notoedris is the other one that is pretty highly contagious as well. It's probably the most common mange that cats get, even though it's uncommon to, for them to get it. And those are pretty easily treated these days with the, with the medications we have. You can use Revolution um, on mange uh, and apply it once, and then I usually use it again in two weeks instead of uh, instead of waiting a month, and uh, it works quite well. You, if you've got a kitten who's really crusted over with um, yellow crusting, which can happen with the notoedres, then you want to really clean all that off. But in any case, I would uh, find out really what's going on. If the kitten has a clear diagnosis from the vet of having demodectic mange, that's more of an immune system issue with the kitten. Bringing it into a stressful environment with lots of other critters is not the best thing for the kitten unless you're going to keep him in a, um, a completely separate room, which would be sort of an extra bathroom or bedroom or laundry room. Right. So if, if you have a foster area, if if they have a foster area where they do this, then it's... then. Mostly make sure it's not ringworm, right? Is that what you're saying? Yes, absolutely, not ringworm. But if it if it truly is mange, you know, it should be on the way to getting a lot better already if yeah. if it's had one dose of medication. So, um, yeah, sarcoptic mange and even demodectic mange is now pretty treatable, certainly in dogs, cats with revolution, um, pretty treatable. You shouldn't need to do all of the lime sulfur dips and all that stinky stuff anymore. Okay. So, all right. So it's, 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 but, but very contagious. So if it's that particular, if, yeah. if it's that particular type. Yeah. Okay. I think it's very kind of these people who to even consider with a newborn taking in a, a foster. Right. Um, but you can, uh, you can blow up in your face, so sure. to speak. Yeah. All right. Scout or Scott glasses again, Scout in Danbury. I was hanging out on the back porch with Tufer and Toby, also known as my 16-year-old male kitty and my year-old house bunny, and we were both getting pretty uh, bitten up pretty bad by mosquitoes. Now I'm kind of wondering if either of my little friends, or my little friends, could catch a disease from mosquito bites the way people can, like West Nile or malaria, etc. It is possible for kitties to get heartworm disease from mosquitoes. Um, but they will, uh, malaria is not in, in this area, um, in Danbury. Um, but uh, West Nile, of course, certainly, uh, excuse me, uh, e- Eastern equine encephalitis, um, West Nile virus, although I haven't heard much about that. And that is not uh, transmissible to, um, to cats. So the things that I would think about with the bunny, I'm not sure, to tell you the truth. I don't. I don't think bunnies, rabbits certainly don't get heartworm disease that I know of, and uh, uh, neither do they get those, are they susceptible to those encephal- encephalitis viruses. Cats are not either, um, but they can get heartworm disease. It's not common in cats. It's much more common to happen in dogs. And even so, this part of the country, not so prevalent to have heartworm. Um, in the south, it's much more prevalent. So I wouldn't worry about it if it's a one-time uh, out on the porch, but if it's a repeated thing, then um, you know there are lots of mosquitoes. Then I would just not take the 
to take the critters out there in and, the evening. And and same same deal for the bunny. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't think it's a. I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think. I don't know that the mosquitoes can really get through that bunny fur. Yeah. To bite them, but I certainly wouldn't risk it with my cat if there were lots of mosquitoes to do that sort of every day. Besides the fact that um, Scout is taking a chance of of catching something like like E E E himself. Yeah, himself. Or herself. Right. Um. And 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 then we can just add to that sixteen year old male kitty. Right. Which is, you know, getting up there. So whereas it doesn't mean, you know, you just you just want to be a little more. Right. Good question. But those um, those mosquito days are coming to an end. Yes, now. they sure are. <laughs> In the dark, I'm gonna I'm going to genetically engineer a new type of mosquito. All right, um, Luke in Canaan. Do thermal blankets for dogs really work? What's the story with them? I can't tell if it's just hype. There are a few kinds, some called self-warming, some called thermal. Some are quilted and some are like shiny silver space material. It's hard to ask a dog if it's really warm enough, but mine likes to sleep, but mine like to sleep on the porch, so if they work, I'll shell out the big bucks. So is this a blanket that you're talking about a blanket blanket or a, a coat that you would put on the dog? I I I, I <laughs> Okay. It looks because like it looks like a blanket blanket. But I, I mean, I'm just reading the. I'm, yeah. I'm reading the, those. You know, those shiny thermal blankets um, do work well to keep heat in, but you have to have a dog who's going to stay in one spot, and or be able to get back under the blanket. So, so yeah, I think that they do work pretty well. Um, it, it, this is ostensibly, I would guess, for a dog who's going to be living outdoors or out on the porch. I guess. Because they, but out on the porch, because they like it on the porch. Hmm. Well, dogs. In my, um, in my experience, dogs like some dogs love to be outside, and in fact, they don't want to come in. Those dogs that have so much heat in their bodies, and they frequently have poodle hair <laughs> type hair, right. and they don't want to come inside. Um, and you just have to make them come in because you don't want to leave them out there with the coyotes all night. But. Um, so if they prefer to be out, sometimes they, they don't really, are, are not going to use a blanket. But I, I think, you know, if you want your dog to, if the dog really wants to stay out on the porch, of course they're safer from the critters, um, you know, how are they going to, when, when they get cold enough, get out underneath of a blanket? So that's really, I guess, the big question. Right. Or maybe just lying on top of it. Mm-hmm. So on top of one of those shiny blankets isn't going to help at all. It, it just reflects back the, the body heat and traps it in. So that wouldn't do it. I'm okay. not sure my answer is very helpful. No, that's, that's, uh, but that's <laughs> actually that, that makes sense. So it, it's like unless you can get them underneath it, don't waste the money is my assessment of what you're saying. Right. And, you know, it does. lying on it doesn't. It, it, lying on it as you would lie on a dog bed isn't going to mm-hmm. do the but trick. But if you, if you put one of those dog beds out with the sides on it, and it and it fits the dog pretty well. Then if it gets down, you know, if they're outside and it gets down, you've got a dog with a with a really good coat, and it gets down to into you know to be forty or something, they can curl up on the bed. So it really is kind of a judgment call. If you've got an old dog, absolutely not. Right. Okay. Um, and now Ellery in Litchfield. When my boyfriend and I first got our six year old coonhound Beulah. He was big on feeding her treats, so many treats. His go-to was cheese, and Beulah got chunky, so I started making him give her only low-calorie dog treats. But she has a sensitive stomach, and those don't really agree with her. So finally, I got him to compromise with carrots. Luckily, Beulah loves carrots. But is there such a thing as too many carrots for a dog? Yes, there's such a thing as too many of anything. So everything, and I say this every show, everything in moderation. I sound like my mother. Um, I think that um, a couple of carrots a day for an average-sized dog would be plenty of carrots. The carrots are sugary, and they're very high fiber if they're, especially if they're, you know, raw carrots. And uh, so it depends on what your dog can tolerate. Um, you know, the key here is really why do we feel the need to give treats all the time. I am going to get up on my soapbox and talk about having an empty stomach being a really healthy thing for everybody. Um, 
snacking, snacking, snacking all the time is not good for your gut bacteria. So if you want to have a healthy immune system and you want to have a healthy gut, then meal feeding is the way to go. And so, you know, twice a day I'm okay with, but doing a snack every hour in between there, you're, you're somewhat defeating the purpose. So you, we have to get over this whole snacking thing. If, in fact, you're using them for training with a young dog, then it's completely understandable. But um, when they're full grown, you know, maybe um, a biscuit when they come in at night, maybe a biscuit if you need to do that when they come in, or a, a treat of some kind when they come in um, from outside, in the morning, because you need to get them in to go to work, that's okay. But this constant feeding is probably one of the worst things you can do for a dog. Not only for their weight, but also for their intestines, for the micro um, flora in the intestine. And so limiting the treats is a really good idea. It doesn't even matter to me what they are. It seems interesting that the low-fat treats would be irritating when the um, when cheese isn't. I- but struck with by that as well but yeah I but carrots i think are a good idea carrots and green beans for a little added fiber um, but you have to really do it in moderation so if you've got a 50 pound dog i would say two carrots no more than that two full-size carrots and i will just say that i was uh, one of the first people to discover there is such a thing as a carrot overdose i've i've discovered in practice both carrot overdose and green bean overdose and one was uh, <laughs> feline and one was canine not necessarily in this order. And so I have to say thank you very much, Dr. Cannon. Thank you for having me today. And this has been Pet Files Ask the Vet, underwritten by the Millerton Veterinary Practice, 518-789-3440, millertonvet.com.